Hey, how's it going, guys? Nick Ricardo here with Fireman Tips. We got a few guest speakers on deck today. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Martin Dorian. I'm a paramedic. And I'm uh, Dan Ancelon. I'm a paramedic as well. All right, so like guaranteed today in my uh, IG feed, I said how a little thing, how to survive medic internship. Before we get started, a little tool I picked up on the internet from Rescue Me, R-E-S-Q-Me. -E. It's a little car escape tool. It has a few different tools in this little device. I thought it was pretty neat. Has a little serrated edge where you disengage this pin. Now you could cut the seatbelt if you need to escape your car. I thought it was pretty neat. And also a little window breaker at the other top of the edge. You keep it on your keychain, whatever. All right. Just so you guys know, I was not sponsored or paid to uh, give a little show and tell of this tool. So let's get started, all right? So how to, how to survive medic internship, right? This is where you put it all together. This is where you put it, put it in together, all your knowledge from didactic, all of your IV starts from clinicals and all the medications you were able to hold in your hands when you were told by a nurse, hey, go in and give this or whatever. You're putting it all together, especially the scope of practice that you're working under for that county, you gotta know that as well, all right? So it all comes into play it's either you do, it's either you show up for the game or you don't. All right. So here's a little bit of things that we we put together: how to survive internship for the paramedic student. All right. So we're gonna break it down little by little. So from, from our individual experiences, Martin's gonna talk about his, Dan's gonna be talking about his, and I'm gonna be talking about mine as well. All right. So Martin, you wanna talk about yours real quick? All right. So first off, I went into paramedic school without any experience. Uh, I always feared the, the the big sharp tank. Uh, I knew paramedic school was tough, and uh, you know I was testing for a lot of fire processes, and I took OCFA's test for the third time. And after I'm not passing, I said, "Man, I'm gonna take the big dive." So I went ahead. I went with two other buddies, and I went into paramedic school. Knew I was in over my head, but I knew I knew I had to be done. So I took took the bullet and signed up. And I'm not gonna tell you, it was very rough. And from the get go, I was behind the eight ball. Um, I thought that was tough, but I really struggled with internship where every call and every day I was just beating myself up because I never ran a chest pan, I never ran a abdominal pan, never ran a full arrest, I never ran an overdose. But luckily, uh, uh, I had a really great preceptor named Matt Lathrop and Corey Gremmel. And they never gave up on me. But another big thing, big key that made me survive medic school was I, my attitude. That's what kept me going. That's how I survived. Even though I was getting beat up, I still kept my head up and I still kept in the fight. And uh, truly, I can say that's what made it out because my preceptors knew that I was struggling, but he saw I kept swinging and I was still in the fight. And I had it rough. Uh, unfortunately, during a pair of Mexico in the middle of my internship, my uh, grandpa passed away. Short story, a crazy world. My best friend who works for LAFD was also in paramedical. We did everything together. His first full arrest was my grandpa. And unfortunately, you know, he did the best he could and didn't make it. And uh, my grandpa was like a, a hero to me. And he always taught me in life that anything that you start in life, you should always finish. And I kept that in the back of my mind. And knew with internship, I uh, was gonna get extended, which I was prepared for. Uh, I had to finish my internship with Anaheim. And uh, I kept swinging, I was still in the fight. And with, like I said, I was able to fortunately make it out. And, and it would have been a lot easier and smoother if I prepared myself and went to and took the dive and didn't work at a 911 company besides an IFT company, but I got complacent and comfortable. So my recommendation is if it scares you, challenge yourself, do it, and you'll be a lot more prepared. Go ahead, Dan. So obviously my experience was a little different than Martin's. I worked as an EMT in the 911 system for about two years before I went to paramedic school. I've run multiple full arrests before they had multiple stab wounds, gunshots, uh, a lot of different variations of, of calls. So my experience was a little bit easier than Martin's was uh, just because I had that experience. But uh, we were still kind of in the same boat uh, once you start internship. Um, you know, they call it the duck effect. Everybody's calm and cool on the surface, but on the inside, you're, you're, you're scared to death because, you know, there's a lot of money on the line. That's that you paid for paramedic school. You know, you want to make it, you want to get your P card. So obviously the number one thing for me is like, be prepared for the unknown because you never know exactly what's going to happen, what's going to be next, but you always got to stay ready, stay ready. If you stay consistent, doing the same things over and over, that will definitely help you, you know, have a system. If you have a system, it's just like you know everything second nature. You'll get everything done. Um, the second best thing is always treat your patients, right? Always treat your patients. So my very first call in internship was a teenager. He was drunk at school. He was inside the, uh, the nurse's office. He had like three or four water bottles of vodka. 
and I thought like any other patient would, right? You see it as an EMT, you see all the medics, they just ship them BLS, no treatment done. But obviously nausea, nausea was an uh, indication, vomiting was an indication, right? Um, I could have given this guy Zofran, given him fluids, uh, could have done all this stuff. In my very first call of internship, I got ripped a new one because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I, you need to always treat your patients because you're a new medic, right? You're not a 20 year medic that can ship some ETOH uh, BLS because you know, you, you're so used to seeing it. So make sure that you always treat your patients. The second thing is your attitude, right? Just like how Martin was talking about. If you have a good attitude, you know, your preceptor will work with you. They'll try to get you through it, try to push you through it. Always have a smile on your face. Be very respectful to everybody. Don't, you can beat yourself up, but you do it on your own time. Don't show it to anybody else, right? Also, another thing is, is roll with what you have to say, right? You always want to roll with what you have to say. Have a game plan and stick with it. Once you get that into your mind of this is what I'm going to do, get it done. Don't hesitate, right? If you hesitate and you start thinking, oh man, I should have done this or oh, I should have done that. Then there's some conflict there. They'll see some weakness inside of you. And then they're going to be like, this kid doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have a decisive plan. He's not going with the route that he's choosing. So you want to be, have that confidence and roll with what you're going through, right? So everybody's going to be scared. Like I said, that duck effect. You're going to be very composed on the outside, but on the inside, you're going to be, your wheels are going to be turning. You're going to have goosebumps. You're going to be nervous, but make sure you get all that stuff done, right? Have that confidence and build on that because that will get you through medic school, right? And then obviously, you know, your protocols inside and out from Orange County, Riverside, wherever you're working. I work in Kern County. And our, my protocol is different from these two. So like, obviously you need to know your protocols because what I run for a chest pain is a little different from their running. And during this COVID pandemic, we were just talking about this, like all the airway stuff, the innovation stuff, we're doing things totally separate. So you guys need to know that inside and out, like the back of your hand, because once that time comes, like, you know what to do. Like I said, have a good system so you, you can revert back to that. And then it's just ABC right after that. One, step one, step two, step three, step four, and just roll with it, baby. You're good. <clears throat> Man, what exactly what Martin said, what exactly what Dan said, take this with you, right? We did all of the dirty work already. We did all the dirty work already. We lived, the, we lived that life. We made all those mistakes, learn from our mistakes, take our advice and run with it so you could be successful and survive that internship. These are some of the bullet points that I came up with that I felt like were super pertinent to my experience in internship. So coming from going into medic school, I had some years at McCormick Ambulance working in, in Inglewood, Hawthorne. So I had some time underneath my belt as an EMT. So I felt pretty, I felt like I was ready to go. I felt like it, this was about time. It should have been happening a long time ago, but finally I got the money. And I jumped in and I was lucky enough to jump in with these guys, all right? so. Step number one, this is what I tell people all the time when I used to went, when I went back to OCMT to help out some of the students, this is what I would tell them. I said, be like a cop and a medic at the same time. So what I mean by that is when you go up on scene, you want to be like a cop with your questioning because when you're a paramedic, it's all about questioning, getting to the root of the cause. Why is this patient altered? What the heck happened? How much drug did they intake? What route did they intake? It's all about questioning, all right, with your paramedic interventions. All right, as well as your scene presence. As a paramedic, it's all about scene presence. All right, you're not at the corner of the wall anymore like an EMT. Some EMTs are getting it in the middle of the scene, but some EMTs are also against the wall. All right, as a paramedic, you're in the fight. All right, you're right in the middle of the scene. It's all about that big chest being on scene and having your authority and getting your questions rolling, all right? Along with being a paramedic at the same time, having that drug box in your head and also on the ground and knowing which drug you're gonna pull out, knowing the contrast, knowing the indications, knowing the side effects, knowing the precautions and also what dosages you are going with for your scope of practice in that county. All right, be a cop, be a medic at the same time, all right? Number two, have no holes in your game, all right? I tell this to everybody. It's almost like you're a mixed martial artist, you're an MMA fighter, right? Having no holes in your game. Let's say if you're an MMA fighter, you wanna make sure you surround yourself with all the arts of mixed martial arts, right? You wanna make sure you train jujitsu, you wanna make sure you train Muay Thai, kickboxing, wrestling, whatever. 
All right, if you don't, some guy, if, let's say you don't practice wrestling, they take you down, you don't know how to sprawl, you're done. You can't get back up, all right? Same thing with medic school. You gotta know your drugs. You gotta know the EKG. You gotta know respiratory. You gotta know how to innovate. Why don't you innovate? You gotta know everything, all right? Get ready and don't have any holes in your game for that medic to really exploit those holes and go in for the kill. Don't let him smell blood, all right? He's a shark, don't let him smell blood. Next thing, body posture and body language, nonverbal communication says a lot, all right? When you go up on scene, just for an example, who are you gonna, who are you gonna trust with your family member? Who are you gonna trust with your, with your son, with your daughter, with your grandma, your grandpa? Someone that holds a monitor, a drug box like this, going in scene like that, slouch shoulders, not big chest, no confidence in this, right? When you're walking through the door frame, you wanna be like this, boom, all right? Big chest, big shoulders, back all tight, monitor in one hand, drug box in the other hand, you're ready to go, all right? With your body posture. And also, you wanna beat your preceptor in that door every single time, all right? Be eager to go on scene. Be eager to assess that patient that shows that preceptor that you're ready to go to the game, all right? All right, be prepared for the unknown. Be prepared for the unknown call. Always expect the unexpected call. When I was by myself, when I was at the firefighter's desk, the paramedic desk, by myself, I was expecting the unknown. So I was practicing the delivering the babies. I was practicing the OB calls. I was practicing the multi-system trauma calls where the patient's bleeding out. I'm, I'm practicing the traumatic cardiac arrest. I'm practicing anything I could think of. I was practicing and imagining it in my brain. So when that call does happen, it's almost like I ran that call already. I ran that call in my brain already. So I'm not so blindsided from that call when it's happening in real life, right? You wanna roll that call. Everything, imagine yourself going on one knee, assessing to the patient, getting at to the patient's height or lowering the patient so you're, not, so you're not intimidating them and just taking it from there. Imagining the whole call play out in your head when you're by yourself, all right? That's gonna make you feel like you already have that rep underneath your belt so you're ready for that delivery in the field, all right? Know your scope of practice. This is what I tell people all the time. Know your scope of practice even better than your preceptor sometimes because in According to your scope, let's say you go to OC, San Bernardino County, Isoma, LA County EMS, Kern County EMS, the scope is always changing. That medical director is always tweaking protocols. So it's very important that the, that the intern, that medic intern is on top of the scope of practice. Sometimes that preceptor might be at the old scope of practice protocols. There's always changing. So you wanna make sure that you are up to date with the scope of practice and know it even better than your preceptor does, all right? Cause he's gonna challenge you. There's gonna be some times when it's called Thunderdome, when you guys are seeing around the kitchen table and the crew just asking you, all right, what's the scope for chest pain? What's the scope for, for stroke patient? What's the scope for trauma? What's our trauma triage criteria? You gotta make sure you know all of the scope of practice criteria for that county in which you work for, even better than your preceptor. All right, know your drugs inside and out, all right? Know your drugs inside and out. You, if you're dealing with drugs, you gotta know what the heck you're giving, right? You gotta know the, in, you gotta know the indications, you gotta know the contraindications, of course. You gotta know the side effects, you gotta know the precautions, what type of dose do you start out, how much can you repeat at, and how much do you cap at before you call base hospital for additional rounds, right? You gotta know everything about the drugs. How does it work within the body? What the heck, how long does it take to affect it within the body? There's so much, this might be overwhelming, but trust me, this is what you gotta know. Sometimes when I was on scene, my preceptor always tried to trip me up. So as soon as I, for example, one time I was giving an nebulizer treatment without buteral, and my preceptor asked me, what's the class of that? I said, sympathomimetic bronchial dilator beta 2 agonist. Sympathomimetic bronchial dilator beta 2 agonist, all right? So you gotta be, you gotta be conscious of your preceptor is trying to give you a hard time in the middle of the scene sometimes, asking you, hey, how's that work? Right when you're doing it, he's gonna ask you, all right, how the heck does nitro work? Right when you're assessing the patient and administering that medication. So he's gonna try to trip you up, be ready for that, all right? We're giving you this advice because it happened to us. All right, with whatever you say, roll with it. All right, so except when the patient is in danger with your, with your judgment that you made that intervention, except when your team with your crew, they might be in danger with that whatever uh, whatever intervention that you did, or if you're in danger, all right? But whatever, besides that, if no one's life is in danger with whatever you said, whatever you said, roll with it. Because if you go back on what you said, that means that you're not confident in whatever you said, and 
If you're not confident, that preceptor is gonna tear you apart. It's very important. Okay, at, at the end of the day, that preceptor wants to feel comfortable with you operating on your own as a paramedic, whether it be a private ambulance company or at a fire department. You have to feel comfortable with you having the world as your oyster and operating on your own. And potentially he wants to say, could this guy operate on my mom, all right? That's what it comes down to. Have a game plan going to the call. I'm not saying whatever the dispatch says, that's what it's gonna be, because that's not what it is. If it comes up for a chest pain, it's not always gonna be a chest pain. But what I'm trying to say is, have a game plan. If it's a chest pain, when you do your assessment, the, the chief complaint comes out to be chest pain, what do you do for a chest pain? Are you gonna auscultate? Are you gonna do your OPQRC questions? What kind of medications are you gonna administer? Right, ask for nitro, oxygen, IV. You gotta have a game plan, all right? And have also a secondary game plan, A, B, C, D sometimes as a game plan. And also what it all comes down to, this is a short term sacrifice for a long term goal. All right, so I'm talking about going all in, going all in. This is gonna suck, but I'm telling you it's gonna be worth it. Medic school is not easy, all right? I'm telling you it's gonna be worth it, all right? But we all went through it. We all went through it and I'm saying I'm not gonna do it again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it again in the same lifetime, but I'm saying short-term sacrifice, long-term goal, all right? This is FireMed Tips. And guys, like, comment, share this video. Let us know, let us know what you wanna see next, but this is something that we wanted to give to you guys. We thought it was very pertinent for everybody that was asking us in our DMs for internship advice, all those medic students, all right? So we're here for you guys, all right? Thanks, thanks for your time.